Shoot them things. Whoo, glory. Isn't that good? Well, that's even louder. Turn me down, way down. Whatever's going on there. You got me yet? I don't know what happened back there. I'm good. Turn to John chapter 10. Once we get the voice of God out of the, <laughs> out of the sound system to scare you to death, <laughs> now that you're awake and I'm out of breath, we'll get there. John chapter 10, we introduced this text. You remember this goes all the way back to verse 11. There's four sermons that Jesus really has in this chapter. The second one begins in verse 11 where He discusses the true shepherd. Remember in the verses prior to that, we talked about the other wayers and the gate wayers. Now we're finding out about the true character of Christ Himself. In verse 11, He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth His life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling doth not the sheep, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. And I am known of mine. Aren't you thankful God knows us and we can know Him? Isn't that an amazing thought? As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And we talked about extensively what that means in that text last week about Christ giving His life for us. Willingly laying down His life. Verse 16. Now let's think for a minute. We're learning about the character of God. Verse 16, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be what? One fold, and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. The other sheep, is what he says here in verse 16. Who are the other sheep? Who are they? Well, we know that they're the host, as Brother Wendell said, the future Gentile believers. Christ spoke of His sheepfold, which existed really in the form of the old covenant that God had made with Abraham and Israel, and he embraced Israel as the true children of God and the Jewish nation as His people. We know that. That was the old covenant. That was His people, His God's chosen people. That was Israel. So he says there again, I have another sheep, other sheep. Who, who are these? Well, we know those are the Gentiles. That's us. Did you know that? Most of us. I, some of y'all, if you did your DNA, you may be some Jewish. I'm not sure. Some of you give like you're... No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Listen, I got some advice. When I was a... Um, when I was in college, as I was going through school, I was a butcher. I cut meat while Debbie and I, when we first got married. I did that in a, in a predominantly orthodox Jewish community. We sold a lot of lamb, a lot of rainbow trout, a lot of salmon, because those were all meats that orthodox Jewish people could eat. When they found out that I was studying for the ministry, the rabbi would allow me to touch the meat and still, still be kosher as long as I wore a glove and used hooks to handle the meat most of the time. And so, I got to be very good friends with the Orthodox Jewish community. I had several of them who would come by, usually later in the night. Uh, I worked till about 9 o'clock at night, and they would come by and they would buy meat from me, and we would talk, and they'd buy me a little 6-ounce Coke. They thought that was the greatest thing ever. They would go buy, you know, one of those little Cokes, and they would bring it to me, and I would cut their meat for them. And they just thought, we're, we're, just, we're, we're doing an amazing thing for him. We're buying him a Coke. Well, number one, I don't drink Cokes, but I didn't. I never turned it down. I just took it. The other thing they would bring me was beef tongue sandwiches. Oh, come on now. If you had never tried it, don't knock it. I never tried it. Sorry. <laughs> never ate one of them. They would tell me how they cooked it, how long it took, hours upon hours to cook this thing. I would sell them the tongues raw, and then they would cook them, and they would, you know, they, they'd make homemade biscuits, and they would bring me these things with a little Coke, okay? And I would throw the meat away and eat the biscuits with some jelly that I'd stole from McDonald's, to be real honest with you. Just confessing here before the Lord. Okay. Uh, so, or Bojangles, it was right next to where I worked. One of the two, they had jelly, and I would get some and eat it with my biscuit. 
I was leaving. I was graduating. I told him, listen, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here anymore. Um, I'm moving down to Savannah. Debbie and I are with, with Lindsay, our daughter. And, uh, you know, I hate to tell you this, but I'll be leaving. I won't be here anymore. And they just thought it was a tragedy. Just a tragedy that, that I was leaving. And so they came by one day and they gave, one of them gave me a book and they had, had it signed and they, you know, do some things. So it was really good. But then the guy, they came up to me the last night and he said, let me give you some advice. Now these are Orthodox Jewish men, probably in their late 60s. They looked at me and said this. Son, let me just give you some advice. I said, okay, I'm ready. I'm, I was listening for some words of wisdom that was just going to be amazing. And here's what these two Jewish men told me. He said, don't you ever buy business from a Jewish man. <laughs> Brother Phil laughs. And I'm look, I know there was a look on my face like, okay, I would had no clue. He said, if a Jewish man can't make it work, no one can. <laughs> you understand? These are the Jewish people. The chosen people of God. Great respect for these people. It was amazing how serious they took their faith. So serious. So dedicated to God in the Old Testament, the covenant. Just amazed me. So here Christ is talking about those chosen people that are a part of the fold already, but now He says there are other sheep, and that's the Gentiles, that's us. All of us that are not a part of that Old Covenant with, that He had made with Israel. Those that did not grow up underneath that old covenant, underneath that old promise. Now notice what he says in the text, but catch it just for a moment. He does not say he will bring them into the old covenant. That's not what he says. Into the Jewish nation. That's not what he says. Brother Mark, what, what, why is that so important? Catch this now for a minute. Because what Christ is saying is, Gentiles don't need to become Jews to be saved. Did you catch that? Paul had a huge argument about this. Did you know that in the New Testament? Paul had to write one whole book, one whole epistle that dealt with, listen to me, you don't have to follow after circumcision to be right with God. The same principle applied. You don't have to follow after the dietary laws of the Jewish people. You don't have to do that to become a Christian. And there was an argument that was going on. The Judaizers were trying to tell the new Christians, yeah, you got to do this and you got to do that. And, and Paul and all of them went to Jerusalem, had a big debate and a council, and it came out and said, no, you don't. And I dare say, somewhere in that argument, this verse right here came up. The teaching of Christ. When he said, listen to me, I'm not bringing the other sheep into this fold. That's, that's, not, that's not what he was saying there. I'm not bringing them into that old covenant. You don't need to become a Jew, a part of that race, to become members of the flock of God. There was coming a new era and a new covenant. It's coming. It was going to be consummated under Jesus Christ and His redemptive mission on the cross. Let me, you got your Bibles? I hope you bring them to church. Turn, turn with me to the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Let me show you something. I want to show you where this, this, this is not, <laughs> this is not just, woo, hey, let's, let's figure this out. No, stay with me for a minute. Look, take your Bible, turn to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah talked about this promise. Jeremiah chapter 33, you got, go ahead and turn, I'll give you time to get there. I think that's where I want you to go. I'm sorry. Chapter 31. Verse 33. I'll get you there in a minute. Sorry. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. If you back up to verse 31, let me just say this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a what? New covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Just, okay, let's get the whole context. I, I hate to just give you one verse. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, that I will make a what? New covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land, hand, land of Egypt. That was the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant that he made. Which by my covenant they break. Uh-oh, they, they didn't even hold the covenant. They didn't do what was covenant said. Okay? Although I was a husband of them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel 
After those days, I will put... Now there's a change. Not the old covenant anymore. It's a what? New covenant. Something different. I will put um, the law, what is this new covenant, stay with me, verse 33. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their what? Inward parts and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So something's coming different. So the Gentiles are not going to be engrafted into the Jewish nation, but there's going to be a new covenant that brings all people what? Into one flock. One people of God. Why is that important? Well, you still got your Bibles? Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 9. I'll get my verses right here a minute. Hebrews chapter 9. Start with me and let's just start. Let's start in verse 15. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. The word testament, covenant, same, same word. One Old Testament, one New Testament. And for this cause, He, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the what? The new covenant, testament. Same thing, agreement, binding law, agreement between God and man, what God has set forth. Jesus Christ is the mediator. He's the one who's going to put this in place. He's the one who's going to put this particular testament or this covenant in place. He's the one that's going to put it in place, okay? That by the means of what? Death. So this new covenant was put in place by the death of who? Jesus Christ. So this new agreement, this new covenant, this new promise between God and man was put in place by the death of who? Jesus Christ. You get that so far? Okay. For the redemption of what? Transgressions or sins that were made underneath the what? First Testament, first law, first covenant. So by the first covenant, remember what I told you this morning, the law, you understood that you have done what? You have sinned. The law told you, you have sinned. It made it clear that you have sinned. No doubt about that. If you break the law, you've sinned. But there again, the redemption of those sins was made possible by the what? Keep reading. The death of who? Jesus Christ. They which are called might receive the promise of the internal, inter, uh, 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 eternal inheritance. For stop, okay? So what he's saying, what is the writer of Hebrews saying there? He's saying this new covenant is put in place by the death of Jesus Christ, and this new covenant, hold on, catch this for a minute, doesn't just cover sins or acknowledge sins or get you to understand you've sinned. This covenant brings redemption from sin. Wow. That's something completely different, right? Remember in the Old Testament, the blessings of God were brought to you by what? Obedience. Remember He told the children of Israel, if you obey Me, you will be what? You will be blessed. Those blessings were temporal. Rain for their crops. And they needed rain for their crops to grow. They were temporal things like health. He said there again, you follow the laws of God, you become obedient to them, healthy. Why did He give all those laws? Don't eat this, do eat this. Don't do this. Here's the way you have it. All those things were put in place. Why? Because if you follow them, you could be blessed by God. Health. Remember, He even told them, you don't follow idolatry. You follow the law of God. You will be blessed by My protection. Don't go out and worship other idols. Don't bring that idolatry worship into the children of Israel. Don't enter faith Mary. Don't do those things. Why? Because if you follow the law, you will be blessed by God, by His protection, by His provision. All the things that you need in your life. Now listen to me. That's Old Testament. Did you get that? That's the Old Covenant. You're still in Hebrews? Look at Hebrews chapter 9. Keep reading with me. Look at verse 15 one more time. He's not talking about temporal blessings anymore, is He? Now here's where our health, wealth, and happiness guys ain't going to like me. Because see, they'll tell you this. 
If you're obedient, guess what you're going to have? All the money you need, all the help you need, and you're just going to be walking in this world. Right? Because all it takes is obedience to God. And if you're living your life in obedience to God and faith in Jesus Christ, listen to me, no problems are coming your way. In fact, you're going to be rulers and reigners. You're going to be wealthy, healthy, and wise. Go back and read the text again. Does it say anything about temporal inheritance or blessings? What's the word that he uses there at the end of verse 15? That you might receive the promise of what? Eternal inheritance or blessings from God. You see, in the Old Testament, my sins were not removed. They were what? Covered by the blood. They were not cleansed. They were covered. They were rolled over from year to year after those sacrifices. There was not, the, the sins were not taken away, but they were just cleansed. They were rolled over. They were covered, not cleansed. But here in the, in the New Testament, something different is happening. Redemption means what? That price of my sins was put on Jesus Christ. And because He paid the price for my sin, those sins are no longer on my account. What does that mean, Brother Mark? Here's what it means. You know the word I'm fixing to say. That means I'm justified in the eyes of God. What does that mean? That means God looks at me just as if I never sinned. So underneath this new covenant, and this new promise, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, His death, which has now been enacted because He died on the cross, I now have forgiveness of sins. My sins are cleansed. They're as far as the east is from the west because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And listen to me, that's not just for one time, that's for eternity. Wow. Now let's stop and think here just for a moment. Would you have rather have the temporal or the eternal? Would you rather have something that's going to be an instant, here today, gone tomorrow, or something that's going to last forever? You see, that's, that's the question that's going on here. I'm glad you got your Bibles. Turn to the book of Romans just for a minute. I can't let this go. Turn to Romans chapter 3. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. And I want to support it with Scripture. Romans chapter 3, start with me in verse 23. You know this text very well. Romans 3, verse 23. Some of the young people can probably quote this verse for me. It says, For all have sinned and done what? Come short of the glory of God. And normally that's where we stop, but don't stop there. Look at verse 24. Being justified, remember what I just told you, just as if I never sinned, so when God looks at me, look what it says. Being justified freely. Look, get all this now. Salvation doesn't cost me anything. So I'm being justified. My sins are being cleansed, taken away. What is it going to cost me? For the wages of sin and death, but the gift of God is what? It don't cost me anything. It costs Christ everything. It cost me Nothing. For God so loved the world that He what? Gave His only begotten Son. So this redemption, this forgiveness, this hope I have that my sins are gone for eternity as far as the east is from the west, never to remember it anymore by God. The only way that happens is God freely gives me that. Look what it says in the verse. He freely gives it by His what? Grace. What is Grace. Grace is getting something I don't deserve. God's unmerited favor. So that by the very grace of God, not because I deserve it, not because I earn it, not because I'm good enough for it, just by the very grace of God, He freely, without cost to me, without anything I have to do, He freely gives me this standing with God through the death of who? Look what it says in verse 24. Grace through the redemption that is in who? Christ Jesus. So this grace, this forgiveness, this redemption is given to me by the grace of God 
freely, and I now stand justified because I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. My sins are as far as east as from the west, only through Christ Jesus. Do you understand how good that is? <laughs> but it doesn't stop. Look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. That's a big word that says the wrath of God has been taken away. Jesus Christ took on the wrath of God for me. Because why? I have faith in His blood, His death on the cross, to declare... Not my righteousness, but whose? His righteousness. Keep reading. For the remission of sins that are in the past. So my sins, where are they now? They're in the past. They're gone. They've been removed. Why? Because of what? Jesus Christ. And now, listen to me, I have been declared righteous. Wow. <laughs> Woo, here we go. I'm not just saved. I'm not just redeemed. Now, in the eyes of God, because of the death of Jesus Christ, and my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, by His grace, I am now declared righteous in the eyes of God. Now listen to me, folks. If you understand your sin, and you understand the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you... You ought to be rolling up and down the aisles right now. Because God's done something for you, not just in forgiving your sins, but now you've been declared righteous in the eyes of God. Why is that so important? Because when you leave this world, the only hope you have to get into heaven is when God looks at you and sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ and nothing else. Not your church membership. Not when you came to the altar and prayed. None of that. Not by how much you gave. The only thing that's going to get you in the gates of heaven is when God looks at you and because of your faith in Jesus Christ, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your account and He says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So God didn't just... Listen... And I love the song. Brother Tim knows what I'm talking about. I love the song, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, but I want you to understand something. We are now righteous in the eyes of God. Now here's the question. <laughs> Here we go. The question is, are you living out that righteous life? You've been declared righteous. You have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your account. Now my question to you tonight is, are you living out that righteous nature, that righteousness that God has given you? Are you living that out in your life? Because that's, that's what God's done. Let me give you one more verse. You still in Romans? Don't give up on me yet. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness that it might be just and the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus Christ. So who, who is this wonderful thing for? Not only redemption, but now I'm declared righteous in the eyes of a holy God. Who is this for? Who gets that? What's he saying? That God declares them righteous who do what? Who believe in who? Jesus Christ. So no other way. No other way can you ever stand righteous and enter the gates of heaven because no sin can enter into the presence of God. No other way can you be declared righteous, justified in the eyes of God except through the belief in Jesus Christ that He died for your sins. By the grace of God, He saves you. That's the only way. And if you follow the rest of the text out, he says, can you boast in the law? No. But we conclude therefore that man is justified by faith and without the deeds of the law. Wow. Go back to our text in John. I'll give you time to get there. So this is this other sheep. People who did not know that law, who did not understand the law of God, they'd never heard of probably the Torah or anything else. They're going to be brought into there again. 
this family of God, this flock, through this wonderful covenant of faith in Jesus Christ and His death on the cross. Now folks, listen to me once again. That's all us Gentiles. We need to get excited about that. Because we didn't have a hope until then. You understand that? We did not have a hope until Jesus Christ came. Now stay with me. Because look what Christ said there. I have. And other sheep, I have. Now that implies predestination. Oh, that's a dirty word, right? I have indicates divine foreknowledge. You see, Christ looks ahead and He sees the success of His mission and His work. He saw the work of grace and the birth of spiritual lives in the children of God throughout the centuries. Christ saw that. Remember, He's 100% God. He sees all of eternity at one time. He sees the success of His mission. He sees tonight as men and women, boys and girls, and this morning came to Jesus Christ. He saw all of that when He looked at this flock. Folks, listen to me. God's still building His church. God's still saving souls. Don't don't think God is... It's finished. It's not. God is still working. Christ saw that. He saw the power. He saw the success of the church. Now, this predestination thing. If God saw that... Now, we as free will Baptists, we understand what that means. That everybody who embraces the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ will be saved. Got your Bibles? Some of you are looking at me dumbfounded. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. You didn't know you was going to have to use your Bible in church, did you? Let's figure this out because I want you to understand what we believe. And why we believe it. I don't want you to come to church, at Free Will Baptist Church, and somebody say, what do you believe? Well, go ask Brother Mark. I don't want you to do that. Ephesians chapter 1. Well, beginning in verse 3. Let's just read here for a minute. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So, what we're fixing to talk about comes through what? Our relationship with who? Jesus Christ. We've been blessed... God has blessed us to know Jesus Christ. He's blessed us to bring us into this fold, to bring us into the relationship with Jesus Christ. Look in verse 4. According as He hath chosen us... Whoa, stop. God has chosen who? Us. Who's us? We'll go back and read verse 3. Those who do what? Believe in Jesus Christ, right? He's chosen us who believe in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So what is Paul writing there in the book of Ephesians? He's saying God knew the plan of salvation before the foundation of the world. And God determined before the world was ever created that those who would believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, would be saved. They would receive the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God determined that way before the world was created. You see, there are some people who want you to think this, that all of a sudden God created heaven and earth, He put Adam and Eve in the garden, and they messed up, and God said, "Uh uh-oh, now what are we going to do? So then He put together some kind of plan that would send Jesus Christ to the cross and die, and so that way He made everything right after He messed up and didn't know what man was going to do, and now we're in trouble, so i got to come up with something. No. God in His wisdom, God in His foreknowledge, knew exactly, listen to me, He knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin. He knew it. And He already had the plan of salvation in place before He ever created anything that we know or see or anything. That listen, He said, this is going to be the plan that whosoever believes in My Son Jesus Christ will be saved. And they will enjoy these spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Brother Mark, how do you know that? Look at verse 5. Having predestinated who? Us. Those who what? Believe. 
He's talking to Christians, right? Having predestinated us into the adoption of what? Children. That means He's brought us into the what? The family, the flock that I've been talking about in John chapter 10. Verse 16. He's bringing us in through what? Our faith in Jesus Christ that He determined before the foundation of the world that all who believe should be saved in Christ Jesus. According to the what? Look at verse 5. Why did He do that? Because He had to? No. Because Adam and Eve sinned? No. Because I'm such a good person? (laughs) No. Why did He do that? It was the good pleasure of His will. Not mine. Not Adam and Eve's. Not Moses, not Abraham, not Joshua, not Peter, not Paul. But He did it out of His own free will. He chose to save us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? Why did He do that? Look in verse 6. Isn't this good? It's, It's simple. To praise and the glory of His grace, just because of His grace. His abundant, amazing, wonderful, abundant grace. Because of His grace. Not because we deserved it, but because of His wonderful, amazing grace, He chose to do what? Accept us. Look, we're in. He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Now we're part of the family of God. Remember, we've been adopted now to the children of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are the children of God. Read back John chapter 1. To Him who's believed, He gave us the power, the authority, the right to become the children of God. Wow. Why did He do it? Look at the end of verse 7. According to the riches of His grace. Grace. Marvelous grace. Infinite grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Only by His grace. By His grace He determined. By His grace He determined through the free gift of Jesus Christ. And His death on the cross, that I would be saved. No other reason. Did God know? Yes, He did. Did God determine what the plan of salvation is? Yes, He did. Does He know what decision you're going to make? Yes, He does. But you have a free will to choose. Will you choose to accept Christ? That great gift. Back to our text. Back in John. Don't let me lose you. Stay with me. I'm turning there. You can turn there too. John chapter 10. So this predestined, we know know what's happening here. But look what he says here. He said, Them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold. They must hear, they must bring. Once again, it shows the, the true shepherd. He's leading them. They hear His voice, and guess what they do? They respond. And what do they become? They become one fold and one shepherd. What does that mean? That means that Jesus Christ wants all of us who believe to become one family. That all believers will be united in one word, in one faith, in one hope, as Paul said. Now here's the problem. Sometimes we've gotten so, um, how can I say this kindly? We've gotten so interested in left and right, we forget there's an up and down. (laughs) I'm not going to get political here for a minute. But see, we've become so passionate about left and right, that we've forgotten the most important thing is this up and down relationship. You see, when we get this one right, we'll get this one right. Remember what Christ said the greatest commandment was? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. That, that's, that's this one. What's the second one? And then love your neighbor, that's this one, as yourself. Do you think there's a reason He put this one first and this one second? You see, when we get this one right, then we'll all be one 
family. We'll all be one faith. We'll all be one hope. We'll all be one Lord. We'll all be in one baptism. We will all be one church. And let me remind you something just for a moment, dear, honestly, lovely, free will Baptist. When we get to heaven, there won't be a corner of heaven for free will Baptist. I just pop a few bubbles. There won't be the National Convention of Free Will Baptists meeting on this corner of glory. Guess what? We are one church, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. And sometimes we need to remember that. Because that's what Christ is trying to teach us here. There's going to be one truth. Jesus Christ. There's going to be one doctrine that is free from all error. One Lord. One faith. So what is implied here in this text is an amazing thing for me is that the grace of God is for all mankind. Now, stay with me for a minute because I want to talk to you about grace just a minute. We like to talk about grace as I said this morning, that we got a whole church culture that is preaching grace, grace, grace. And we forget the law, but that's okay. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon from this morning. Grace is an amazing thing. We've talked about it. We, we understood it. We've even talked about it here tonight. But let me just say this for a moment. God's grace is not dependent upon my goodness, nor is it dependent upon the depth of my sin. It is effective, it is powerful to save all men no matter how deep their sin, no matter how good they are, no matter how bad they are, God's grace is still effective and God's grace is still powerful. You see, here's the problem with grace. Some of us think we're too good to really need grace. We live a good moral life. And so therefore, we look at our lives and say, well, you know, grace, I don't do anything really wrong, so I don't really need it. <laughs> oh boy. Or then we got people over here that just say, listen to me, I've sinned so much, I am so far gone that God's grace can't reach me. That's usually where we're at. So let me just say this to you tonight, church. God's grace is always sufficient. Isn't that what Paul said? My grace... Paul said, "Come, Lord, take this thorn away. <laughs> he said, no. Nah. Three times! Paul, my grace is sufficient. Doesn't matter where you're at, that grace is still sufficient. Brother Mark, why, why is that important? I'm going to share one more verse with you. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to show you why that grace is sufficient. Because that grace is centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember who the Apostle Paul was. He was a persecutor of the church before God called him on the road to Damascus. In fact, he watched we believe Stephen be stoned to death, a leader of the church. Paul was very passionate. He was just passionately wrong. So Paul understood the grace of God probably better than most of us do. And here's what he said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God. That's the power of the gospel, right? Grace. That's the power of the gospel. The grace of God. For I'm not ashamed of the power, there again, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Who is that power? Who is that grace? Who is that gospel for? Look what he says there. To everyone that what? Believeth. To the Jew and to the Greek. To the Gentile. Sometimes I don't want us to forget about the grace of God. But I also, there again, I want you to understand 
that God has called us, and through that grace, He has called us to salvation. And He's called every one of us, He's called all people to that salvation. The gospel is not just for one, it's not just for another, it's not just for the Jew, it's not just for the Greek, it is for what? Everyone. Now here's the thing, here's the great thing is, when we share the gospel, it contains that grace of God that changes people's lives. Are you willing to share that? You see, here's what I want you to understand. There's not a lot of people going to listen to you if you go to try to correct them about what they're doing wrong in their life and all those things. And I'm not telling you you don't have to do that. But I want you to understand, if you ever walk up to somebody and you start talking about grace, they'll probably start listening to you. Unmerited favor of God. Something I did not deserve that God has done for me. The power of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. That I can't do anything, but God not only redeems me from my sin, He declares me righteous in the eyes of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we forget about that grace. Because that grace is what changed us. That grace is what saved us. And that grace, listen to me, is what will one day bring us together. I don't know what's going on in your home. I don't know what's going on in your family. I don't know what's going on in the community. I don't Listen to me. But I'm telling you, it is that grace of God that will eventually unite all of us when we gather around the throne of God. I'm convinced we need to start sharing that grace to all people. Let's play again. Our Father, we thank You. Thank You for that grace of God that called us, for the grace of God that keeps us, and that grace of God that will one day lead us home. If there be anyone here tonight that is not living in that grace of God, that has never accepted the free gift of Jesus Christ, had their sins forgiven, be declared righteous in the eyes of God, to have heaven as their home, if there be anyone here tonight who does not understand that wonderful promise, that gift that God, You have given to us. May the night be the night that they surrender their life to You and live in that grace. Lord, as Christians tonight, would You just remind us of that grace that brought us into the family of God. Only by that grace. Nothing else. It is that grace that called us. We didn't deserve it. It is that grace that saved us and removed our sin. We didn't deserve it. It is that grace that has declared us righteous in the eyes of God. We don't deserve it. That wonderful, matchless, wonderful grace of Christ is being offered to all tonight. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how good we are, no matter how bad we are, that grace is being offered tonight. The good news. Won't you accept it tonight? I'm going to ask you to stand with your head bowed, your eyes closed. Are you living in that grace, dear Christian? As we sing, won't you come? Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there in the blood of the blood was spilled. You know that grace? Grace, grace. Are you living in that grace tonight? God's grace. Are you cherishing that grace tonight? That will pardon and cleanse. Pray with me just for a moment. That marvelous grace. You know, it's real easy to abuse grace. To take advantage of it. That somehow or another, it's just always going to be there. That God is always... Be careful. Be careful. 
Don't abuse that grace. Dear Christian, I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know how you're living. God has extended His grace to you. He has saved you by that grace. And I want to encourage you, live your life in a way that pleases God. Don't abuse the grace of God. If you are, I encourage you, stop, change, repent tonight. We're going to sing one more verse. One more verse. This is for you. As we sing, won't you come? Dark is the state that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Lighter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace. thankful tonight for that grace, that amazing grace that saved us. The amazing grace that keeps us. And that grace that one day lead us home. Lord, thank You for all that You've done. And it's in Your precious name we pray. All God's people said,